Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we've got none other than John Collins, a British coaching legend and one of the few people that has a unique uh, historical perspective of the game, having been involved with it for so long. Uh, when you talk about coaching, he's done it at every single level, uh, being involved with coaching the first ever National League game in England. Uh, and, and coaching the team that won the first, that was the first English team to ever win a game in Europe, has been at the helm of the Great Britain senior women and the England senior women uh, qualifying for European Championships. Uh, was involved with the founding of the Basketball Coaches Association uh, in the UK. So really has a wealth of experience. Um, you know, having been involved, I think now for for over six decades, that was just fascinating to get into. He's someone I've wanted to have on the show for a long time to be able to really pick his brain and kind of um, get some of this stuff documented, which we spoke up a little bit about as well. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in the importance of the history of the game in terms of creating a culture and 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 letting us know kind of what what's happened and what's come before us, so we can learn from from that. And uh, yeah, we kind of got into that a little bit as well. So it's a, a thoroughly enjoyable conversation, um, which I think uh, yeah, you'll get a lot of value from. Before it does, we do get into it, I do want to mention there's a few little technical errors, uh, t- technical issues that I think are, are worth make, making you aware of. Um, I'm, I'm using new software, so there was, there was, there's some teething problems with getting uh, that working. Uh, we had a bit of a lag, so halfway through, about 30, 40 minutes in, uh, if you're watching visually, you'll notice there's a, there's a sharp cut and the lighting changes uh, because we did uh, have a little break and then start again. Um, well, not from the start, but we started re-recording again. And then also at the end, it ends rather abruptly because we started lagging again. And because we are reaching the sort of 90 minute mark, I just said, let's, you know, let's wrap it up now and we'll do a part two at some point and, and finish it off while I sort out kind of the, the, the teething issues uh, with the new software. So yeah, I just wanted to make you aware of that. As always, before we get into the show, uh, please take two seconds to check out our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash H-W-O-P-S-F-I-X. There you can sign up to give us a monthly or annual contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing we're not asking for a lot of money the price of a cup of coffee the price of a sandwich you won't even notice it leaving uh, your account every month but it goes a long way in helping us do what we're trying to do to help grow this british basketball media landscape so please check out patreon.com forward slash hoops fix as always if you're watching on youtube uh, leave a comment below let me know what you think about what john had to say uh, you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at hoops fix and if you want some private one-on-one one-on-one interaction you can drop me an email sam at hoopsfix.com. anyway that is enough for me. Uh, here is this week's show with John Collins. John, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Uh, like I said before, there's obviously so much history uh, that I think that you are very well placed, one of the few people that has seen so much, been through so much um, to be able to talk about it. So it's something that I'm really excited to get into. The place I always like to start is the beginning. Uh, so rewinding back to your first exposure to basketball, um, how that came to be, uh, what it was that actually uh, first got you into the game. Well, that's a long wind back, Sam, but uh, it goes back to when I was at school. I was at a red brick grammar school in Birmingham. And our PE teacher there, a guy called John Shakespeare, was a, a, a basketball player. He played for the BAI team in Birmingham. That was the Birmingham Athletic Institute. Um, I always thought that he'd played for the 1948 Olympic team. I discovered later that he hadn't made that team. And that was a massive disappointment to him, to me. But he was a, 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 a very good player. And for whatever reason, he introduced the game to us when we were in the sixth form. I remember that we gave a, a, an open day demonstration shooting into netball rings that we'd borrowed from the, uh, from the girls. Um, and we got so enthused about the game that we said, look, you know, we, we need backboards. And he actually from somewhere got some backboards and put them up in our little 70-40 gym. Um, I don't think we played more than a handful of games, but that's where it all started. Was it was it something that you felt like uh, you fell in love with pretty quickly? Uh, or do you think it took a while for you to sort of build up that affinity with it? No, I was absolutely useless. 
I mean, truly, really, I was a rugby player, and um, you, you know, I, I couldn't get my head around the fact that you know that you, there were certain things that you weren't permitted to do, uh, and that it was all down to a little bit of skill. But yeah, I gradually did, and I remember again. It, it's astonishing how you remember certain names. I remember one of the better players. Uh, his name was Chown, Brian Chown, and he said, John, if you come into the gym with me at lunchtime, I'll, I'll actually teach you how to throw the spherical thing through the round thing. Uh, and so he did. Um, and, you know, I guess I improved a little bit and played for the team. And yes, I, I mean, it was just in such a total contrast to, to rugby um, that, yes, I, that's when I fell in love with the, with the sport. How far did your own playing uh, go? Obviously, I know that you know coaching was the was the big thing that, that ended up becoming your career. But uh, you know, with the actual playing side of things, you know, how far did you take it? Uh, and and never really took it to any 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 great level. And and that's always something that has uh, it, well, in in one way, it's challenged me because I've dealt with some very very talented players and very talented athletes. And, and I've always been aware that I'd never played at that level. And, and in a way, it was always me learning from them as much as them learning from me. Um, at, at the same time, when I've been working with less able players, I guess I've been able to identify the problems that they've had and, and, and try to help them. Um, so it, it's a strange situation, but... In, in all honesty, you know, the level that I played at was, was never very great. I mean, I suppose the biggest game I ever played in, of which there is no acknowledgement at all, because I think the score sheet has actually been lost. And it goes back to an intermediate cup final between old Nortonians, and I, I, I really do not remember who, and the game was played at the Royal Albert Hall. And um, one of our players, I played very occasionally for Old Norton, Old Norton, Old Tonians, and um, one of our better players was injured. I got drafted in on the bench. I think I actually played for seven seconds. But because I was a late replacement, my name never made it to the program. So, you know, I was mortified. So that's the, that's the only real level that I've ever really played at. Royal Albert Hall, what a venue, actually. Um, I've heard so many people speak about uh, basketball events being held at Royal Albert Hall. That, that one time, I think I went on the website, and if you if you go on the website, they've got a historical page talking about sort of previous events. I don't know if you've seen it, where they've got some photos of basketball, uh, basketball sort of finals events and stuff that have happened there. And it just, I mean, visually, it just looks incredible as a venue. Um, do you remember kind of like what it looked like as a venue and the feel of it as a venue? Yeah, I, I did. I mean, I, 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 you know, I kidded myself that I actually got changed where the famous conductor John Barbaroli used to get changed. But that's a myth. But you know, it's a nice little story. But I remember, well, I remember very clearly making our way out onto the court, which was kind of at a high level because they played tennis there as well so we were kind of up on a, almost like a stage we weren't down at, at, at floor level we were up at, slightly higher and I remember leaving the dressing room they weren't locker rooms they really were dressing rooms and and making our way to the court and half the team got lost so, you know, while we were warming up, literally half our team was wandering around the corridors of the Royal Albert Hall, trying to find their way onto court. It was it was quite bizarre. And we were very worried because we had one very good player, a guy called Paul Bat Gaskin, uh, um, who was a teacher in Birmingham. And, 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 you know, he didn't appear until about 15 minutes before the game was due to start. It was quite bizarre. Wow. Well, what would you say about the um, the skill level of players back then? When you talk about kind of the sort of, I guess, the general state of of basketball in England, uh, when you talk about the sort of the level of the level of talent, level of skill of players compared to say now, uh, what would you say about the two? Do you feel like the game has come a long way? Oh yeah, massively uh, at, at all levels. Um, from a technical point of view, it, it's advanced amazingly 
Um, from an athletic point of view, um, the, the, the players that we see around today are, are far better than the players that were around in those days. Uh, and tactically, well, tactically, <laughs> there was nothing. Um, I remember, I remember a, a coach wandering in and introducing a three-player weave, and we looked at him in a gas and what, what is this guy talking about? Um, but it was about that time that people were coming back from the states, people were coming back from um, from Europe. Um, myself, when I was at college, although I was not anything to do with the University of London, there was a thing called the University of London Institute of Sport. And I, I don't know how, it was through rugby that I got invited to play basketball. So I actually ended up playing basketball for the University of London. Um, and and I, I think I was one of only three English guys involved. All the rest were Americans, Persians, Egyptians. It was a really eclectic group of people. And that was the first time that I got introduced. These, these guys obviously were used to playing at a much higher level than I'd ever been exposed to. So, you know, that was the first time I'd start seeing another side of the game. So when I went back to, to Birmingham to start teaching, I suppose I, I was a little bit ahead of many other people because of that experience that I'd had. Well, just when we're talking about, like, how old were you ar around this time? Are we talking sort of early twenties, late teens, or? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I was um, I was eighteen when I went to college. I did two years in London and then a year uh, 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 in Chester, and because again, my knowledge of, of basketball was a little bit further advanced than the, um, the the majority of other players. There was a lecturer there who fancied himself as a bit of a player. And as you did in those days, the lecturers used to play for the student team. And uh, he fancied himself as a little bit of a coach. Um, the, the rest of the players knew he hadn't got a clue what he was talking about. Uh, and basically... Um, he got phased out around Christmas and I became the player coach. So we were playing in a league that extended all along the, the North Wales coast right to Anglesey and to Bangor. Uh, and we travelled along there. And, and that's where I go back to, you know, I was like 21. Uh, and that was my first introduction to what might be deemed as coaching. It, it wasn't really coaching. It was controlling a wild bunch of students. But that was, you know, the first experience. And when we talk about sort of, um, I guess, culturally where basketball sat in the minds of the public, like, uh, you know, was it still seen as... Um, you know, I, I, well, I don't know, was it seen as an American sport? Was it seen as an, uh, a developing sport that had a lot of potential that people felt was going to grow into a much bigger thing in England? Like kind of, uh, how do people feel about the sport in general? Or was it very much kind of out to one side and it wasn't on most people's radar? Very much that, very much off the radar. I would say that the majority of people, in fact, virtually everybody, you know, what they what they thought of when they heard basketball, they thought about the Harlem Globetrotters. That was basketball. That was their perception of basketball. Uh, and they had real no idea of how competitive basketball was played. And they, they, were, they, they, they were just these isolated pockets. And, and I began to realise that there were certain areas where it was almost an unknown sport. Uh, other areas where you looked upon almost as a freak, you know, why can't you play a proper sport? What are you, what are you playing this silly girls game for? And then other parts of, of the country where, uh, you know, it was really, it was was developing and because of the nature of the population. Uh, London, Birmingham, I remember going to Manchester and being absolutely shocked at the standard that, that, that was going out there, but it was these little pockets so no, there was no general perception of the by the public of anything really. Then oh, it's the Harlem Globetrotters, and these strange people are trying to copy them. Well, no, we're not trying to copy them. You know what we're trying to do is the proper game. 
Yeah, it's it's amazing uh, how much the Harlem Globetrotters, even to this day, uh, have penetrated popular culture. You know, like still, when I have conversations with some of my friends who have no knowledge of basketball, their first their first thing that they'll say would be the Harlem Globetrotters. You know, um, it's it's one of them things that it has transcend. Well, it definitely has transcended uh, the sport. When we're talking about timelines, so this was we're talking in the '60s now, right? Uh, of a, of around when. Well, it wasn't a thing culturally. People weren't really seeing it as it was. Some places it wasn't a thing. Some places there were little hotbeds. Kind of where would you say were the hotbeds uh, for basketball at that point? I think the places I mentioned, uh, certainly around London, you know, we were aware even um, beyond what we were playing as a college and a university that there there were clubs around um, London. Uh, I would put my hand up and say that I never made any effort to go and watch it um, because the games weren't played in places where you could watch. I mean, I really have clear memories of of the Polytechnic building up at the top of Oxford Street. And this is an absolute true story. There was a notorious referee um, no longer with us sadly um, who, who was um, notorious for basically walking onto the court and deciding who was going to win and if you weren't that team you were going to suffer uh, and we, to get to the court at the poly and, and some older people may remember this you walked out of the locker rooms down a long corridor and then up a flight of about half a dozen steps into the court um, and and there were swing doors onto the court uh, and I remember this referee in the game that, that I was playing in um, running backwards very carefully making sure that he could see what was happening hitting the doors and going backwards through the doors and down the steps um, we, we we actually didn't stop playing. The opposition did. We scored and then picked him up. Uh, and that's absolutely true. Um, we were playing on courts with balconies. Again, people around London might remember the old YMCA, where you literally on one side of the court had to develop a very particular um, flat shot. Now, my story is, and this is absolutely untrue, my story is that the jump shot took over from the set shot in that court because you couldn't make a set shot from the corner because it literally would hit, hit the balcony. But, but I was aware of these clubs, uh, the YMCA, the Poly um, in, in London. Uh, later on, when I was in Chester, I became aware of, of clubs in, in Manchester and, and in Liverpool. Um, obviously, when I started teaching in Birmingham, uh, the, the, the teams in Birmingham, but of course, the, the leagues were very fragmented. There was no national league. All the leagues were local leagues, but there were these pockets and then other great tranches of the country where the game was, was hardly known. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating to uh, to kind of hear that the the early stages of of kind of the game over here. Like I find I find the stories around it um, so so interesting. So for your own your own journey, like you got thrust into a sort of player coach role, which was your first experience as of what you'd call as as maybe coaching. Um, but then when when did it kind of become uh, a bit more of a serious thing? Uh, kind of what was your progression as a coach from there? Well, I suppose like a, a, a number of people, I started teaching. I was very fortunate to teach in, in a, a very big, comprehensive school in Birmingham. Um, a head of department, for whatever reason, I don't know, he, he was a new head of department. He didn't arrive until, until Christmas. So I'd had a, a wonderful term of, of teaching, which was you know a little bit scary but you know very pleasant and very enjoyable um i was looking after the under 15 rugby team uh, and um, the head of department arrived his name was bob garner and we had a meeting of all the pe teachers uh, and he said right there were certain things we want to develop in this school um we we you know we know that the boys play basketball the the, the basketball was run 
by um, a, a geography teacher and, and a wonderful guy who was in, in, in charge of remedial work, um, a guy called Doug Cheshire. Uh, and Bob Garner looked at me and he said, Collins, you've played some basketball, I see from your CV, you're in charge of basketball. And that was it. You know, no, by, you know, uh, and, and, and that really was going to be me looking after the teams, um, controlling the age group teams in the Birmingham Schools League, um, talking to the two teachers who were running some basketball and incorporating them in, into, you know, what, uh, you know, was already a reasonable basketball program and developing it and taking it further uh, and one of the alumni of that school was um, a guy called um, Dave Fisher uh, the father the father of Simon Fisher he was actually he was actually a, a, a pupil at the school when I started teaching he was in the sixth form when I was the rookie teacher Wow. So when you, when you're approaching that situation and you you know you know that now you're in charge of basketball um you know you're going to be coaching how how were you approaching it like how did you work out what you're actually going to be teaching and how you're going to you know get these players improve the basketball players and develop them like were there resources that like books that you could you could get to were there other coaches that you spoke to like kind of what was your process for actually working out what you were going to do or were you just freestyling it no, my the process was very very simple. I, I realised how little I knew, uh, and knew I had to do something about it. Um, I, I, I've never been a, a great book person. Uh, I was wondering where I should sit now, and I thought I could sit in front of my book, because everybody sits in front of their bookcases, don't they, these days? Yeah. So I've got my book. Uh, I've never been great into, but that's a joke. I, I've never been great into books. So I started talking around. The guy who had, had, had introduced me to the sport was still teaching in Birmingham. Um, so I spoke to him. Um, he had a friend who spoke, uh, who taught at another local grammar school who also had played at a reasonable level. I spoke with him and then decided I, I got to go and do something more. And it was something very simple to start with. Uh, and, and I enrolled on something called um, the, the um, Blackpool Easter School. Uh, and it, be, it was very, very famous. And basically, it was an Easter school for physical education of, of, of you know, the whole tranche of, of, of physical education. And I just basically enrolled on, on the basketball court. Um, very early on in my teaching career, I got introduced um, to a guy from... Um, Kings Norton Grammar School, and that's how I became linked to the, the, the club there, Old Nortonians, and that was a guy called Malcolm Burgess, um, and he was um, went on to become a, a good level referee, um, and he was running the Birmingham schools. I spoke with him about how I could um, find out more, and basically just got hungry for any courses at all. And I preferred to go on courses and learn that way than, than, than studying books. Uh, I do have some books from, from back then, but they really were pretty basic. Uh, uh, and, you know, didn't really give me what I was looking for. And I found those courses and being able to interact with people on the courses much more useful. What, what role, out of interest, what role did the Federation play at that point? Because I think Barcelona has been around since like 1936, I feel like it's some, something like that. Like, were, were they doing stuff around coach education? Like, or was it, was it, I mean, obviously, as they've grown, there's there's a, an ability, and especially with the change in technology and stuff, there's an ability to have much more central control over things. But, but obviously, back then, I mean, I don't even know what the organisation was like, how, whether or not they had staff, like... Uh, yeah, was there involvement from them in time in terms of trying to develop um, coaches, clubs, teams, basketball in general, or was it very much more a federation that helped uh, helped exist for national team competitions? You've hit a very raw nerve here, Sam, because my basketball development went off in a very strange tangent. 
um, and, and at one stage, and I kind of I can't remember it where it was, but I'd, I'd actually be coaching at a reasonably high level. Um, you know, I was involved in the national league. I was getting involved with the national teams, and and I'd done it all away away from any kind of formal basketball education. I got a level two. I got my level two at um, uh, at the Easter School. I remember being examined by a tutor. Um, I by that time I'd been introduced to Brian Coleman, uh, Kerry Mumford, uh, Keith Mitchell was still running courses, um, uh, and, and my link with the governing body was very much aside um you know and it, and it went ahead that way for, for for some time so um yes i was aware of the governing body and, and and you know they were staffing things like the the blackpool easter school and 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 there were odd courses here and there but it was very hit and miss and there seemed to be to my recollection no formal sort of structure at all all right Interesting. So you, you eventually made the move down to Sutton and Crystal Palace. How, yeah. how, how, did, that, how did that move uh, come about? Okay. Um, because I was... I thought that my involvement with, with basketball in Birmingham uh, would help me with my career. And, 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 and you know, I was very naive. Um, I helped run the Birmingham Schools Basketball League with Malcolm Burgess and it was a big league it really was by then you know the vast majority of the schools were, were playing basketball um, you know because we were a, a hotbed um, I'd coached quite successfully the what was called then the Greater Birmingham teams um, you know, I had some pretty good players gone through the ranks. We'd done well in the championships. We'd never won anything. We'd got we got through to semi-finals and one final. And I thought that alongside my teaching, that would be recognised and I would get promotion. And I didn't. Um, I made one slight move from a, a the big comprehensive school to a small secondary school in Birmingham. But then when I was applying for what you might call the bigger jobs this was after six years of teaching um i was going nowhere uh, and i literally was told by a p inspector why are you wasting so much time um on this you know this representative basketball and and running leagues that's not what teaching is about and that was a, a bit of a body blow and and miffed i literally applied for jobs all over the place and it just happened I got an interview for a new school, new comprehensive school in Sutton, Surrey, uh, and, and, and I got the job of head of department. Uh, and I remember going down with my, my, my first wife. We were looking for a house. Uh, and I was walking down the high street in Sutton, and a guy came up to me and he said, I, I, I recognize you, you know, you know, where I said, from Birmingham. He said, that's where I know you from. Um, I was at Birmingham University. You used to, you, know, you used to referee. And I said, yeah, I did some refereeing. And he said, yeah, you're involved in basketball. I said, yeah, I'm involved in basketball. He said, well, I'm involved with the club here. Uh, would you like to get involved? And I'm not, I really not investigated. I didn't know anything about it. And that's how I got involved with the with the then Sutton Club, which was based on Sutton Grammar School. Uh, they were looking for somewhere to practice and to play. So I got them into the new school, Greenshaw High School. And um, we, 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 we practiced there. I coached the second team and played for the second team. And that was the start of the relationship with, with Sutton and Crystal Palace. So when you actually went down, you hadn't you, you hadn't really thought about the basketball side of things. It was very much a career decision, and uh, and basketball ended up presenting itself in a way. Like, had you thought, you know, once you get settled, you're going to look into clubs locally and try and carry on the basketball thing, or at that point were you like, well, you know, it, it hasn't advanced your career in the way that you thought it was going to be, so you were prepared to potentially give it up? 
I was so miffed that, you know, what I thought naively would help me with my career, I really didn't think about it. It was never, I, I, I knew that I would introduce basketball at the school. That was, you know, taken for granted. But as far as getting involved in basketball outside of, of the school, didn't even cross my mind. All I was interested in was looking around to, 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 to find a rugby team to play for, to be quite honest. I was more interested wow. in, in developing that. And it, it, if I hadn't bumped into into David Lord in, in, in Sutton High Street, I really don't know what would have happened. I don't know. Wow. It's crazy how these how these things are. Oh, absolutely. How these, things, how these things, work, things work out. So with that club, you actually ended up coaching in the first ever National League game. Am I right in thinking that? Yeah. So can you talk about, I guess, the formation of the National League when you heard that there was, you know, uh, an attempt to try and create a National League, what the kind of, I guess, the motivation um, of creating it was? And then, yeah, that experience of, of being involved in, in, in coaching the first, the first ever National League game. Well, after a, a while being involved in coaching the second team, um, I, I don't know all the details, but the players in the first... I was going around watching first team games and... I suppose you might say I was the assistant coach, but in in name only. And the players got a little bit disillusioned with the the coach because the coach, first and foremost, was a referee. And he was a very good referee. And he refereed at a very high international level. Um, you know, his name would be, be well known to a good many older people in basketball. But the players felt that his, his interest in coaching was secondary and, and I, get, I guess basically they ousted him uh, and asked me to coach and that was a, a massive step for me because all my experience of coaching had really been with um, with, with students, with, with pupils at a school. So it was a massive step for me. Um, we were playing in the London League, which was a really good league. There were some really very, very good teams there. Uh, and it was obvious that there were people at work trying to establish a national league. Um, and, and from the Sutton point of view, that guy was David Last. Uh, he, he, he was a, 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 a real forerunner, really uh, thoughtful guy of knowing and seeing where basketball needed to go. Um, you know, so I was very much on the periphery coaching the team. And suddenly, you know, we realised we were now playing in this new beast called the National League. Uh, and the first game was going to be up uh, in Ellesmere Port. Uh, it was going to be on television uh, uh, against a team sponsored by a tobacco company, which gave out tobacco before the game. Um, and, and, and so it was. It was on television. Um, I'm not quite sure how many people were in the hall, but it was more than there should have been. Um, and, and that was it, yeah. Suddenly from London League to National League, wham, bam. And yeah, it was a massive shock. The, um, I think the 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 first year of the National League was ninety seven seventy one ninety seventy two yeah. I think I think right, right. Um, so by that point you know bearing in mind you know we'd spoken about basketball in the sixties and, and it and it kind of was still very much on the fringes you know you just mentioned there like this first year of the National League you've got a TV deal and there's way more people there than than should have been there uh, how had basketball grown and been able to sort of I guess, uh, become more of a thing to the point where, you know, you're getting crowds now, there's sponsorship, there's TV deals. Like, what had changed over those last few years to make it more of um, a known sport in the country? I honestly don't know because, you know, I'd been very much locked away with schools basketball. I, I really hadn't been very much associated with, with the senior game. Uh, so... I'm not really much of an authority of, of knowing quite how it, it, it had developed. Um, I mean, there still weren't, there was no history of a, a lot of people watching basketball. Um, there became, um, I, I suppose, a, an increased interest in the finals. They used to run the, the finals at, the, at Crystal Palace. Uh, and, and that used to get a, a crowd. But I think for the most part, 
um, it, it was still a, a bit of a gimmick um, in terms of people watching, and there there still weren't the auditoriums, the courts that that that, that could handle you know a, any number of, of spectators. It was at that stage that it it was seeming to develop, and I guess the powers that be thought that a national league was the way to take it forward, and I guess that the people who formed it. Uh, who were behind it, you know, had in their mind that it, this was going to become a spectator sport. Quite what their their dreams were, I, I really don't know. You know, obviously I had conversations with David Last and um, he had a bit of knowledge of basketball in, 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 in France and, you know, he hoped that eventually it would be a spectator sport of, of, of some importance. But you know, I'm, I wasn't aware of how and it, it had grown. To be quite honest, was the was it being driven by the clubs or was it administered by the the, the governing body at that point? In those early years. <laughs> that's that's a very interesting question. I I would say, I would say that it was the clubs dragging the federation. Right. I'm, I'm I'm pretty certain that's the way it was. Uh, yes, I, I, there, I feel like I there feel, were people. Uh, there were people around who, you know, wanted to take it forward. Whether they'd had discussions with the federation about how it might be achieved, I don't know. But I think there was a, 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 a need. There was a, um, a, an impetus which needed to take the sport to the next level. Yeah, I, f I feel like from my vague memories, knowledge from conversations I've had, that uh, the National League. Yeah, it was it was club very club driven as you, as you say, and then and then of course what happened years later was the BBL was the same sort of thing where the clubs felt they were being held back by, being held back by the federation and needed to break away again and then create a professional league. So it's kind of like history repeating itself a little bit there. Um, I, I, I think yes. it was a sport we we could look back on a lot of developments in the sport at, at, at all levels and seen it's very much like that we, we seem to have a very good habit of not learning from the past and we go back and repeat the mistakes we've we've made previously and that's a great sadness but i, I think it would be true to say that it was very much club driven yeah yeah i mean that's, that whole thing about that's <laughs> the whole thing about the history of the game and, and you know history is deemed to repeat itself if you kind of don't know about it that is that hits the nail on the head there with so, with so many issues around uh, the game but but again it's like how are, how are people meant to know you know unless unless we're having conversations with the likes of yourself the likes of John Atkinson you know the likes of Mark Clark the people that have been around the game for so many years that information just doesn't exist like it's so hard to find um, to build you know I'm working with some interns at the moment funnily enough from uh, from UNC and they're helping me with a bunch of, um, we're trying to sort of start documenting various different things around the game here, like historical stuff on web pages, on the, on the website so that people can access them. And I realize with them, every time I try to give them a brief to do something, it's almost impossible for them to do because it's, they can't just Google and find the information. Uh, yeah. The only way to find a lot of that information is to pick up the phone and have the phone conversations with the likes of yourself um, to extract that information. It's it's like, yeah, there needs, there needs to be some type of project, uh, which is, well, I guess the archive at, at Worcester is kind of doing that where, where the focus is to kind of get all this stuff archived accessible so that we can start building building the history so that one we don't repeat it and also i think that really helps with um building the culture around the game over the long term you know because yeah people don't realize the rich history that we that we have with basketball in this country uh, i think there's an assumption that because it has been a bit of a struggle uh it has its issues that it's always been like that um and there's definitely been a lot of highs that that people are completely not aware of yeah, I, I think it's really important that people are able to look back and, and, and reflect on some of the mistakes that were made and also have an opportunity to to rejoice in some of the successes that, that have not been um, chronicled. Um, I, I know that um, John Atkinson, Jamie, my ex-wife Jenny have worked very, very hard about the the legacy project in Worcester, and and hopefully that will will help. Uh, and I think it's it, it's really important. In other countries, it's very very easy to look back on 
the history of the game in Spain, in Italy, in Greece. And we just don't have that facility here. And I think it's very, very important. When you talk about, uh, when you think about some of the most underrated moments in British basketball history that most of the young people, or even myself, you know, don't know about um, or are underappreciated, underrecognized, what what are some of the the top moments that that come to mind for you? Well, I think reflecting back on the start of the National League, we start we spoke about that first game up in Ellesmere Port, which was amazing. I mean, a lot of people would just not know about that. Also, some of the international success. I mean, there was a big debate between Vic Ambler with his senior men's team and my senior women's team as to which was the first team to qualify for the old European Championships. I think we beat him by a few hours, but he would probably debate that. Uh, and shortly after that, uh, Rick Waldridge with, with the cadet men uh, qualifying for the old European Star Championships. Uh, and I well remember when we went to the championships in Banja Luka, uh, Dr. Hep, who was a high official in FIBA, sitting with me in, in his trousers, his braces and, and his vest, um, saying how pleased he was that England had truly joined the FIBA international family, that we had showed that we could compete at that level and how welcome we were and how important it was to the European game that we were part of it. And, you know, that was that meant a lot to me. And again, it's probably something that is just unknown to, to many, many other people. There was a there was a thing around uh, when uh, when we won the Olympic bid and, and the new the new British Performance Basketball, British Basketball Federation was was set up. Um, that almost that they had gone about their business wiping <laughs> historical records with, when they were talking about this is the you know this is the first time this has happened or or this is the first this is the most points that a GB player has scored they weren't accounting for all of that history that had happened you know back in the eighties when there were I think it was eighties early nineties when there were also GB teams and Olympic qualifying tournaments and, and Europeans and stuff obviously one of those uh, well a couple of those you were involved with right um, you know how, how challenging is that. Uh, you know, when we talk about the importance of the history, when when we have, you know, a new federation that comes around, there's all this excitement around about London 2012, um, but actually they're they're starting from zero and they're saying that this is the start of British basketball, the start of Great Britain basketball is in 2000, what was it, 2006, uh, and had 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 sort of not considered all of the the previous history that had come before it. I think you're absolutely correct, and I'm, obviously I'm biased. I think they missed a trick. I think they they missed an opportunity to 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 look back to see where we had come from um, in in very different circumstances, with a lot less finance, um, probably a lot less talent, and and also a lot less preparation time. I mean, you know, some little points are very important. We. We were in a situation with a, a, a Great Britain team which was looking to, to try and qualify for the Seoul Olympics, which was very, very unlikely in terms of the pool we were drawn in. But we actually were on the free throw line with an opportunity to tie the score against a very, very talented French team. Now, most people wouldn't even know that, apart from those women and my coaching staff that were involved. We, we, we were that close. I'm not saying we deserved it or anything, but I think things like that are important. Uh, going back to a, an Olympic qualification tournament for men in Ausberg, again, it was a situation where two teams would qualify and the second team uh, literally was going to be decided on points for and against in, in, in a, in a win-loss situation. And it gets very complicated because it's not only you scoring two points, it's a matter of the other team losing two points when you actually come to that balance. And I, I remember talking to David Turner when he came back from that tournament, you know, how close we'd been. And literally Vic Ambler was, was there coaching with somebody behind him with a, I don't think it was even a calculator, a piece of paper saying, oh, we're at a moment we're plus four or we're minus two. Now those were exciting, um, dramatic 
parts of history. And it was, I think it was very sad that they decided they, they were just going to ignore them and pretend, I don't know, pretend they didn't happen. I don't know why, but there you go. What do you think is the best way of changing um the lack of documented history like like you know, we've already we've already mentioned the 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 archive at Worcester which is obviously doing a great job but even even then it's great if you can get there and you can visit it in person and stuff but actually the information is still still quite hard to get to right um yeah like do you have any thoughts around yeah what can be done to make this history more widespread knowledge within within uh, sort of the basketball community uh, in the UK does it need to be um, governing body driven or is there other ways that uh, you think that it could work? I'd love to say it should be governing body driven, but I guess they've got their own sort of problems. Um, and inevitably, it, it's going to be left to volunteers, um, you know, people like your good self, people like other people who are working on this, uh, you know, and maybe that's not the way it should be but i think if it's going to get done that you're the sort of people who are going to do it i i don't know a great deal about technology as you probably gathered even linking with you you know i'm a bit of a luddite but i'm a, i'm really aware of how important this media is and and i think that's you know some kind of visual art archive would be tremendous even if it was only still photographs but you know, there, there, there is material available out there, and, and I think that's the way forward. I, I, I wouldn't count myself as any kind of an expert on this. I really don't know, but I, I agree with you entirely. It, it's very important, and people wiser than myself, you know, I think are needed to take it forward, and I'm not sure the governing bodies will do that. So jumping, jumping back to your story... Um... After that inaugural season uh, in the National League with Sutton and Crystal Palace, uh, you ended up losing your job as the coach. What what, what happened there? Um, well, we had we'd actually competed in Europe. Uh, going back to David, last it was something I think he would always he always thought that we should do. Um, we qualified because of um well basically because we came runners up in a national cup and and that got us an invite and again we you know a majority of people wouldn't know that um Sutton as it was then became the first english men's team to win a round in europe uh, okay albeit only against the danish team but we, we actually won it and then went and played against juventus de badalona um in 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 a packed stadium um, so we then had our second year in uh, in the National League and um, again we played in Europe and we, we lost in Lisbon and at, at the end of that season uh, I think it was I'm looking at a piece of paper and I think it was 72 there was a British Isles Club Championships uh, held up in Withenshaw near Manchester and uh, we actually won that um, we did very, very well. We played very well, and um, I met with David last shortly after that, and um, he basically gave me some very good reasons why I should step down. So whether I was fired or whether I quit and resigned, I'm not quite sure. It was a bit of both. But he wanted to take the club forward. He had ideas of how he wanted to do it, and far be it for me to argue with those, you know, with those thoughts. How aware were you at that time, um, the relevance, that how historical it was going into Europe and being the first team to... Were you aware of that at the time, or was it only later you kind of realised? No, we, we were aware of, of how important it was. I mean, it was, I mean, it was an, an eye-opener to every single person who, who, who went to, uh, to Badalona. Uh, because when we arrived there, they we were unique. We were a team from England. We weren't known as a basketball playing nation, and and so it was opening their eyes. You know, and 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 the Spanish treated it as if we were Bologna or Tracer Milan or, or a team from Greece. Um, I mean, the the hotel we stayed at. Um, they they even got their supporters 
riding around on, on motor scooters, hooting horns all the way through the night. You know, they think it was that important that we didn't get any sleep. I mean, they would have beaten us, you know, anyway. But, you know, that, you know, it was, it, it was important to us, important to them. And, and again, I think it was something that um, the Federation at the time didn't make a, a big deal of. You know, y yes, we'd done it. Yes, it was nice. All the shot warriors had, had competed in Europe, but it, it just seemed to be one of those things that had happened, you know, for us. And I'm sure for, 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 for David Last, it was a, a very important movement for, for our club and, and, and for English basketball. How, how important do you think uh, it is for British basketball as a whole to have clubs competing in Europe? And, and if you do think it's very important, like why is it important that we have teams competing on the competent continent and not just uh, domestically? I think because of the performance of our national teams, particularly our age group teams, and I spend a lot of time in Spain and I've met coaches from other countries, they have a massive respect for the potential of British basketball, particularly the athletic potential. Uh, I mean, they, they talk in the same breath as the, the athletic potential of, of France, and we, we, we see what they've done with that potential. Uh, and in a way, they're confused that they see our national teams doing well, performing well, uh, and they admire what they're doing, and in a way are puzzled that British club teams aren't involved. I mean, it's only when you sit down and explain to them, you know, the reasons, financial, uh, the different makeup of teams, that, that, it, that it makes it very difficult. But, you know, I, I would say, generally speaking, that they, they would welcome uh, British teams in, in European competitions and, and are a little bit surprised and puzzled that, that, that we don't compete at that level. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, Euroleague has 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 not made it a secret that they are desperate for a would love to have a London franchise, and uh, and, and basketball Champions League slash you know FIBA obviously are, are just as open about the fact that you know they want British teams competing in it. I mean, we would have had the London Lions this this year if it wasn't for the unfortunate situation uh, with COVID, um, which is a massive massive shame. Uh, but yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, I think it's it's huge for the game here, and it's something that the whole country can get behind in many ways, like a like a national team competition, you know, um, rather than just the club supporters. It's, it's a it's a big thing for the for the entire sport. So after you were um, let go from from Sutton and Crystal Palace, the move was to Central YMCA, right? Like, how did that come about, and why did you make that move? <laughs> you, you make it sound very dramatic. It, it was um, it, it was a very very simple situation. Um, I, I, I at that time had gone through a divorce. Um, I, I, I'd left teaching. I was doing all sorts of very strange jobs, not least of all driving trucks to, to in, into Europe. Um, and I was persuaded by my ex head of department to go back into teaching. Um, and I went back into teaching at a school in Hackney. And um, basically, there was um, a young lady there who was playing basketball. Um, their team was being coached um, by a, a former player. Uh, he fell ill and they hadn't got a coach. Um, I was asked if I would stand in on, on, a, on a temporary basis. They knew of my involvement at, uh, at Sutton and Crystal Palace. And basically, I just went there to fill in. Um, and I think Dennis was a reluctant coach. Um, and when he saw me breeze in, he thought, this is, uh, this is a way I can get, get out. And basically, I, I, it was by default I took over coaching the women's team there. I'd never coached women. I hadn't got a clue, you know, about what I should be doing or might do. It, it was just an opportunity to coach, which I, you know, I, I accepted. Do you remember those, uh, that first exposure to, to women's basketball, um, whether or not, well, what the, what the big difference is that stuck out for you, how much you had to adapt your style, if you had to adapt it at all, whether there were things that you changed about how you approached coaching uh, when it came to coaching women uh, instead of men? 
you, you, you're trying to me, make me look a fool because I didn't. I just went in and, and, you know, the first thing I said, I'm not going to insult you women by treating you any different, different you know. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you, you're going to work as hard as a men's team. Uh, if, you, if you mess up, you're going to run the lines. You get here on time. We do it, you know, and that was my approach. Looking back and reflecting, I'm surprised they didn't walk out the door. Um, but but the, they didn't. But And it only became a matter of time before I realised that I really did need to to adjust my, my style of coaching. Not necessarily the way we were playing or the style of playing, but mainly the way I treated them as people. Um, and that took... Uh, a little time. I'm a slow learner, but you know, I, I think eventually we, we made some steps. But you know, initially I, I I was so arrogant. I just didn't make any changes at all. In the, in terms of your own personal development as a coach, uh, was it still very much learning by doing and just putting yourself in these situations and you were picking things up and trying things, experimenting, seeing what works, seeing what didn't work, and then kind of adding it to your to your your bag of tricks, so to speak. Um, or had, at this point, any part of your education become, I don't know, more formalised or, or, I don't know, finding clinics to go to or speaking to other coaches, building a network? Like, yeah, what was... I'd be interested in hearing kind of your own sort of uh, journey in terms of your coaching development. Yeah, it, it was quite interesting um, because at that time, the Federation were becoming aware of, of, of coaches and coaches trying to develop... And I was given the opportunity. I'd all, I'd been to I'd been to the states um, quite by accident. It was a, a, um, a summer job, and I was given the opportunity to go to the states and managed to get to to to, to watch some practices in in Michigan. Um, but then I was given the opportunity to go to a coaching clinic in Turin. Um, a couple of the clinicians there were American, um, but there were two Italians. And I mean, my eyes were just opened. And it, 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 again, it was one of those chance things. One of the coaches was Dan Peterson, um, um, an American coach who was coaching in Italy. And he made one of those throwaway comments that clinicians say. They say, well, if ever you'd like to come across and watch my practices, just let me know. So I did. I got in contact with him and said, I met you in Turin. You know, could I come across and watch some of your practices? And he said, sure. So I went across to Milan and, 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 and had, a, had a, a very long weekend in which I was just, the doors were just opened. I watched all the practices. I spent some time in Dan with, in his apartment and, uh, um, even got involved in a very close conversation between Dan and the great Dino Menigan um, about attitudes of players, you know, and I was sitting just gobsmacked. And it was at that stage I, I realised that, I'll be quite honest, a lot of the senior, better known English coaches kept everything to themselves as if they were massive secrets. Uh, 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 and then I suddenly found that here were these other people who who were quite open and would talk to you. Uh, and that's, again, by accident, where my kind of informal education took me. It took me to Europe. Obviously, when I went with national teams to Europe, I was able to make contacts, which I've maintained. Uh, and it was funny, we I bumped into Dan Peterson again, back in Turin a few years ago uh, and and he vaguely remembered me and then when I told him the story we, we, we had a long chat about that time I'd spent there so again it wasn't through that formal side of going to co courses and, and getting qualifications in fact I remember way down my coaching career um, somebody who I won't name from Basketball England said look you know You've done all this, you've coached in Europe, you've got this success, you've taken the English team to European Championships, and you're a level two coach. 
we, we ought to do something about that. W would you mind if we sent someone along um, uh, to give you a kind of verbal test and we can make you a senior coach? I said, yeah, um, no problem. And um, I remember it now. And he, he would probably, Chris Worcester from, from Loughborough, from Leicester, came along, sat in my living room. Uh, he started um, asking me questions. And in the end, he just put his pen down. And he said, this is ridiculous. You, you've got as much to teach me as I can teach you. You've got the qualification. Wow. So I, I guess that's called, a, I think that's called the ultimate backdoor move. <laughs> Unbe unbelievable. It's fascinating that, um, that yeah, despite being on, on, on an island, uh, you know, you ended up crossing, crossing the waters and, and getting actually a lot of your education from from the continent from europe uh, and not not the coaches here why do you think english coaches were so closed i think it was fear i think that they, they thought they had gleaned something had discovered something um and they just didn't want to share it and i found it very strange and all the way along i i remember another story that i tell i remember going my team was competing in the the famous WICB New Year tournament at Crystal Palace. My team was was playing there, and and Tom Becker was was coaching there, and he was running a sideline fast break, and I was fascinated by it, and I'd looked at it and couldn't work out a few things, and quite by accident we we met as you do in the toilets, and and, and as we stood there. I said, Tom, I'm interested in your sideline fast break. Um, you know, would you mind asking a, a few questions about it? And I thought we might go and have a coffee or sit down in the bleachers. But no, he, he literally drew it up on the tiles in the toilets of Crystal Palace. I should have taken a photograph of it, but I memorized it and took it back. And that's how I picked up a, a, another little bit of information. And uh Later on, when we were at the YMCA and they started a men's team there, there was a player there who was teaching in, in England called Larry, um, not Larry Meek, oh, his name escapes me. Um, but again, I, I, I spoke to him, he he came from Chicago and, and we sat and he shared all his thoughts on 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 on, on, on his philosophy of the game and some technicalities and and I found that willingness of other people to share information in sharp contrast to the English coaches that I'd spoken to or not as the case may be do you, do you think that um close-minded uh, mentality uh, persists to this day or do you think that has changed oh i think it's changed um you know certainly um, the conversations I have with, with younger coaches, they seem m much more open. They seem willing to share ideas in a lot of discussion groups, particularly during the COVID. You know, there's been lots of, you know, webinars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there is a, a willingness to share. But you know, I suppose, you know, a disgruntled old man. You know, I might say I've been fortunate to have some quite unique experiences uh, and, and as I step back you know apart from within my own club I felt I might have helped some developing coaches I might have been used a little bit by the federation and I know there are a lot of other older coaches who who felt the same that you know we, we I'm not talking about us telling younger coaches what to do but sharing our experiences maybe identifying some mistakes that we made that we might have helped them uh, and and that again is something that, that, that our federation didn't seem to do very efficiently you were involved with the founding of the Basketball Coach Association in the UK. Um, it was you, you and Mark Dunning, I believe. Uh, sort of, was that off the back of this whole situation of realising your own education was coming, you know, in Europe, and you weren't there wasn't necessarily the the um, sort of the network in in the UK between coaches of, of sharing and 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 that and like kind of what was the driver behind that and what actually what year do you know what oh, not necessarily the specific year but roughly what year was that uh, the bca was founded 
I, I could look down and look at my list, but I can't remember exactly. But I remember, I mean, Mark had been involved in coaches associations for, for, for several years and it had kind of um, slumped and then revived. And, and really it was through Betty Cadona really wanted to restart it and to kickstart it. Uh, and, and she set up a, a, a little committee and... Um, you know, like most committees, we managed to look to invent the horse and, and got a camel. Um, it was a lot of voices going in different directions, different people wanting different things. Uh, and so in the end, it, it was, I suppose, Mark and myself and um, Alan Barber who, who, who really pushed it forward. And, you know, we just basically decided that with limited resources, there were only certain things that we could do. Um, certainly producing a magazine with um, some interesting articles, some technical stuff um, w would be useful which we did we wanted to try and provide a forum where coaches could come and ask for advice and, and, and get support which they maybe felt they couldn't get from other places and then we decided we would try and set up an, an annual camp um, and, and as a little bit of attraction we decided we would link that with a level three award so people could come along for a week and get their their level three or get qualified for the level three obviously they had to do the practical work um separately but we, because of the time frame we could add a little bit of icing to the cake we could do one or two things that you wouldn't normally do in a course so we used to do scouting exercises we used to do a, 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 a day of uh, of psychological preparation um you know we were able to we felt we wanted to take it a, a, a little further so um that was the sort of idea b b b behind the bca i've heard you know so many great stories um about the bca is there is there any uh anything that sticks out in terms of things that you achieve with the bca that you're particularly proud of um, I would because of my links with Europe and oh, everyone keeps saying a lot of people say, oh, you know, why not America? Why not America? Uh, and it wasn't anything against America. It was just that I had the opportunities to get to Europe. Uh, it was a lot cheaper. Um, I liked the food more and the wine was good. So I had my, I had European links. So um, when Mark and I, along with the BCA committee, decided that we would start trying to revive national coaching conferences, I was really tasked with the job of, of trying to persuade some European coaches to come across and, and, uh, and deliver some clinics. Um, and, and the link that we had, we got a link with the assistant coach at Real Madrid, uh, Joanne Plaza. So it was my job to try and link with Joanne, arrange to get him over, look after him uh, um, while he was in, in, in the UK. And I remember we were making some arrangements and he phoned me up and he said, John, there's been a, a, a change of situation. I think I ought to let you know before I accept your information. So I said, oh, well, I thought maybe he got fired or something. And he said, that they, the, the, the head coach is not very well. Uh, they've decided to dispense with him, with his services. This was Marankovic. Um, he said, and they've asked me to be head coach. So there we were with the National Coaching Conference in Northampton, because we felt that was a central venue. Uh, at the college where I was running my academy, and we had got the head coach of Real Madrid, you know, and he was apologising to me to see if it make a difference. And he came and delivered some uh, three absolutely superb clinics, absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, that was a, a, a great story of, of, of a game, what, what could be achieved um you know we were we were supported by the federation the national governing body but but not massively financially we were just totally independent yeah what amazing what amazing story i'm aware of time here so uh i do want to there's a few things i specifically i want i want to cover um 
Number one being Avon Cosmetics Women uh, pro- Women's Program. Like obviously, it's from my understanding uh, one of the most successful sort of legendary um, programs that this country has ever had. That you were obviously involved with for you know a number of a number of years. Um, can you kind of talk about the, the the founding of that program? What the aspirations were? Like I, you know, I heard you in your great interview with with um, with Tony Gobolotto say that the sort of the goal was to to be. The, you know, a, a club like Real Madrid, you know, that was the kind of the level of aspiration uh, that the program had. Like, yeah, can you talk about the kind of the founding of it and how, how you came to be involved with it? I think that came a little bit later. Uh, I mean, the, the people who were mainly um, responsible for the development of, of Avon were Mark and Sue Newton. Uh, they'd been at university in, in Guildford. Um, they were involved in catering and decided that they would would go to Northampton and and set up their business there. And uh, there was a, an existing club which Mark be, be, began to coach, um, getting younger players involved. And that team eventually um, went into Division Two of the National League got promotion and they they basically got ambitious they they wanted to become the the best possible um and and they earmarked um a number of coaches that they felt they would recruit to to take them on that journey uh i was one of them but i wasn't top of the list um and and through circumstances I eventually got invited to, um, to, to, to to coach the team, um, and they were ambitious. They 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 made no pretense about it. They wanted to to win national titles, and realised that to do that, um, that they would have to recruit players. I guess because of my position with an England coach, that I might have some effect on that. Regrettably, that's not very, you know, it's not really very healthy, but it, that's the way it was. Um, once we had s- started establishing ourselves and got the sponsorship from Avon, there were two driving forces. One was a commercial side that Avon obviously would be delighted to be seen in Europe. Uh, and secondly, from our point of view, we, we felt that that would take the women's game forward, that to expose, again, English basketball in Europe would be good and healthy, uh, and more so, it would be good for the area of, of Northampton and Northamptonshire to bring top European teams to you know to northampton and get and get people watching i mean we were getting we were getting big crowds we were packing out our sports hall so it was a dual driver really uh, of commercial ambition and ambition for us um and i suppose you could look back now and say well you know you look at northamptonshire it's not a massive county yet we have two thriving national league teams and and i think much of um, two uh, sorry clubs, uh, and, and I think that a lot of that dates back to those times when those hundreds of people flocked to Ling's Forum to watch high quality women's basketball. Okay, eventually men's basketball came along as well. So it, it was a, 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 an interesting journey. Of course, you you had a fair amount of success. What sort of level of dominance uh, was that team having um, domestically uh, against you know other clubs? I'm, I'm assuming that you were the the best funded, the most ambitious. Um, I mean, maybe you weren't. I don't know. But but like, what sort of yeah? Like when when you talk about the results and and uh, the sort of the performance on the court, what exactly what was happening? Yeah, I mean there were there there were there were seasons where we basically knew that we were the strongest team on the floor and 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 a lot of the recruitment was aimed as much for Europe as it was domestically and and I would be honest enough to say I think we won 14 national titles it should have been 16 it should have been 16 there there were two games that we lost which was no way we should have lost I mean it was just well, the fault of lots of things, but you know, um, and I would admit as a coach 
that in some games it, it, it was a matter of doing things not through necess necessity but almost to prevent the players being bored. We, we were doing some things which really were not necessary, um, you know, and that was no, we weren't being disrespectful to our opposition. We were in a way being respectful because we were trying to run different things that I'd seen and, and, and felt we could try out. But yeah, we, we, we were very, very strong. Hearing you speak about the women's game uh, back then and the sort of the level of uh, you know, support, whether it's from a spectator standpoint, but also commercially. When you look at um, the WBBL now, uh, you know, of course, it does have its struggles commercially uh, and sort of raising money and sponsorship and sort of the uh, stability of, of clubs. Do you think the the female game is in a stronger position now than it, than it was back then? Like, what do you think have, has sort of been the, the barriers that have not allowed it to continue to build upon you know, I guess what would be considered the heyday uh, in in the what was it the eighties? Yeah, I I don't know. It, it, it really is a mystery to me. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, you know, I could surmise about the way that, that the game was taken. Um, I, I I felt that back in those days. If you came along to watch, well, let me just talk about my my team, Avon. You would be able to to look and and see a high quality American player. You would be able to see a high quality dual national, somebody like Kim Pellegrini, someone like Carol Andrew, but alongside them were very talented English players. And also talented young English players. And, and, and I felt, you know, that it, it was a good mix. I'm not saying it's the right mix, but it was good. So that a, a young girl in Northampton could come along and watch that, that team play and say, that I can aspire to that. I, I, would, I could get into that team. Look, there is a local girl playing. I mean, my, my present partner, Karen Goodrich, started as a 14-year-old and made a way through, you know, to become a, a recognised player. And, and, and younger players could recognise that and, 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 and aspire to that. I'm not quite sure that, that that's happening at the moment. Um, I, I'm not a great authority on, on it. I, I lost a little bit of interest in where it was taking. And I know there are people working very, very hard to establish the women's game at that level. And I wish them the best of luck. But it does seem strange that from where we were then, uh, you know, it, it, it's got to to where it is now. And that, you know, look, looking in, in Spain where people will go and watch the women's game. And they don't compare it with Barcelona, Real Madrid or Valencia. They look upon it as the women's game. It's slightly different. OK, there are no slam dunks, da 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 da. But there is an exciting sport that is basketball. And I think that basketball needs to, 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 to move forward together and you know and I wish that you know the women's game did attract more more crowds and you know we could get a little bit more credibility when it, when it came to the founding of uh, of, of North Ant Thunder what, what inspired you to do that um, what, what yeah what made it happen need it was just need um, you, you mentioned us aspiring to be a, a Real Madrid type club. Well, we're never going to be a multi-sport club like like the Real Madrid, but we, we did want uh, to, to to have a club which was a club for male and female, uh, for wheelchair users, um, young players, and, and 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 basically, I would admit that we bit off more than we could chew. And, and financially, we, we got into problems, big problems. And so basically, we broke the Northampton club up into, into three parts. And basically, the men went one way, um, the women went one way, uh, and I took on responsibility for the, the younger players. Um, you know, but, you know, we, we wanted to develop that that whole club 
uh, and, and, and and it didn't work. So we, I took over and, <coughs> excuse me, ran what was the Northamptonshire Schools Basketball Club. And we, we played in the National League. Uh, and, and gradually, as we grew, we decided that we, you know, we would have a men's section there. Um, and from the Northamptonshire Schools, um, which was basically a schools association playing in the National League, um, I got an opportunity to access some funding from England Basketball, as it was then. And basically the funding was to develop and improve an existing facility. We identified a facility uh, and got agreement with the head teacher um, to put some money in to develop their single court sports hall into a double court sports hall. We made the bid, got the money, and everything had to get, was going to go ahead. And then we discovered that the the beams in the existing sports hall were concrete, and you cannot extend from concrete. So that got just that just got put to a to, to, to a back burner. The head then came, and there was reorganisation in Northampton. And every school was going to get a, a new single court sports hall. And the proposal was that my money got added to their money to put a double sports hall in, which would be exclusively of the use of an existing club. But the club was a school's club. And therefore, we had to reform. We had to get a constitution a committee and that's where the women's side of north Ants lightning and the boys and men's side of north Ants thunder developed it was the need to have a club that could use in conjunction with the school that facility and we still get use of that facility uh, for practices and for our games at, at weekend uh, and it's an, obviously a massive bonus to us um, it's complicated because we have to work alongside a pfi provider so we have to negotiate hours that we can get into the facility a lot of people think we can just walk in when we like we can't but we do have use of it exclusively uh, every evening during the week and on saturdays and and that's the how North Ants Lightning and North Ants Thunder developed from the North Ant Schools Basketball Club. Perfect. I think we we have um, a bit of a lag internet connectivity problem, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much for doing this. I think we we'll need to do a part two at some point uh, to get into some of the stuff we haven't had a, a chance to cover because we've been going for a good ninety minutes. But yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, wish you all the best for the remainder of the season, and hopefully uh, we will catch up soon. It's been a pleasure, Sam, and you know, I look forward to hearing from you.